I've always been obsessed with ultimate questions and, of course, find yourself going in circles. But in order to find bedrock, I would look to cosmology, which is based upon science, and then a philosophy of cosmology to make sense, in some sense, of that cosmology. Uh, you have written on this. Tell me what is a philosophy of cosmology? Well, cosmology is the study of the universe, uh, typically defined as the study of the universe at large scales. So you're interested in things like galaxies and so on. I myself think that that's a bit of a restricted definition when you're talking about philosophy of cosmology, because for one thing, a very philosophically interesting question is how common life is in the universe, and maybe life is just confined to the surface of planets, and so you have to look at planets, not just at things like galaxies. Philosophers, I think, can contribute to the cosmological discussion at one level just by pointing out that there's certain ambiguities in how people use words that maybe they're using different definitions and therefore talking past each other and wouldn't it be nice if they used the same definition and all that sort of thing which is what philosophers do a lot of the time. There are interesting questions though about how simplicity gets into our building up our theories on the basis of the evidence. In the case of cosmology, a lot of the theories seem to go a long way beyond the evidence, but you're pushed beyond the evidence by the quest for simplicity. You're trying to get the most simple overlying picture. Well, what is simplicity? And if you define it in various ways, which people are going towards which sort of simplicity when they are trying to build up their theories? That's a very interesting set of questions. There are questions coming from the interaction of cosmology with areas such as theology. If you are a scientist who is deeply religious and you go into the field of cosmology, should you allow your religion to influence the way in which you do your science. On the one hand, you could say that people who are scientists who've been letting themselves be influenced by religion have in the past get into an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> Look at these scientists who were religious and opposed Galileo and Darwin. Uh, they got into very hot water and they are scorned today. On the other hand, you could say you develop a, an inconsistent, schizophrenic state of mind if you think of the cosmos as created by God, but you don't allow this in any way to um, influence what you could think about the cosmos. Let me make that concrete. Suppose you face the theory, which is very popular these days, that there exist large numbers of different universes with different characteristics, and that ours is one of the very, very rare universes in which intelligent life can evolve. Well, as a theologian who is also a cosmologist, you might want to say, no, I'm only going to believe in one universe, but I think that God did a good job in designing this universe, and it is therefore one in which life can evolve. I'm not going to be inclined towards the sort of theory which make me believe in multiple universes. So you could be that sort of cosmologist. Would you be making an intellectual mistake? Would you be committing an intellectual crime? I think not. <laughs> what are some of the questions, the ultimate questions, that uh, a philosophy of cosmology would address? It would address things such as the nature of verification and the extent to which we can reasonably talk about situations when their truth can't be verified. And some people even these days hold to a verification theory of meaning and they say that if something can't be verified, then your words actually lose their meaning when you try to talk about it. You are talking gobbledygook. That's an important question which comes up in philosophy of cosmology. There are questions. And your reaction to that? 
outdated nonsense, dinosaur <laughs> thinking, <laughs> unable, unable to accept the obvious meaningfulness of large numbers of cosmological theories which are out there in the literature. How peculiar it would be to think that if you had a universe which was slowly tending to split like an amoeba, that at the moment when the split had been completed, everything in the other half <laughs> suddenly drifted away into the realm of unmeaning. <laughs> a, a completely ridiculous uh, theory of the sort which you could expect to be dreamed up by a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> but that would mean that we can deal with theories that can't be verified? I think we can certainly say that these theories are meaningful. Uh, suppose I had a theory that metals expand when heated because they're full of little invisible imps and the imps keep on battling more and more strongly uh, as they get heated up because they don't like the heat and that's why they make the, the, the iron bar get longer. I mean, suppose I add to this theory and what's more, these are totally unverifiable imps. Nobody will ever be able to see them. Have my words lost their meaning? No, I can make sense of it. You understood what I said, didn't you? And so on. But is it, is, is it profitable to have that yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, theory? Right. <laughs> no. But that's the second question. That's the second question. Some, some theories which can't be verified are just stupid because uh, they are fantastic. But allowing us to deal with questions that can't be verified, even though the majority, the vast majority may be stupid, that some in there may be legitimate. Some in there And may if we throw away the whole batch, we will yep. lose the essence of maybe what reality is. I, I think it would be very difficult to do modern cosmology if you restricted yourself to believing only in what we can directly verify, because it is very, very difficult to conceive how the cosmos could end just at the limits of where the light rays have been written. <laughs> the only way you can do that is by thinking we live in a, a cosmos with a, a twisted space or multiply connected space. In that case, what we think are 10 different galaxies could be one in the same galaxy, which Reflective. we see again right. and again and again. Right. In this case, we could have a small universe and all the light rays would have had plenty of time to get around that universe in its entirety so we could see everything. But it, un unless you accept that sort of view, you are going to have to accept that the universe extends vastly beyond what we can yeah. see. But even if you had that view, you would still have questions where the beginning of the, what was before the beginning of that, there'd still be a host of questions there would be. that would be in the category of not verifiable, but potentially meaningful. Essentially meaningful and not strongly verifiable, but you could have all sorts of... Um, scientific theories which were relevant. Uh, you could speculate in these areas without going beyond the area of um, theories which physicists have taken seriously. For example, there's a question often comes in, before the, the, the present Big Bang out of which we came, was there a contraction earlier? And uh, people for a long time argued that no, this sort of thing wasn't possible. You couldn't get a reverse. You'd have everything mm -hmm. flying down into a black hole. And you could never get out of that. Since then, people have doubted the so-called singularity theorems, which led to everything going down into the black hole, and said, no, this isn't necessary. It could be that as a universe collapsed, at a certain point, gravity would become repulsive and then it would expand again. Now, nobody has yet got to the sorts of energies at which we can directly test that gravity would become repulsive. But there are some very good scientific reasons for thinking that gravity would indeed become repulsive at very great uh, pressures, very great densities, and so on. 